Meetings members learn all of the Salvation Nation. What is to follow is a story of silver and one of its, one of its most intriguing uses from one of the most important events in modern history. Silver was taken and borrowed from the Treasury Department. And this photograph here shows an example of silver bars being loaded up for this application and use. It's the largest use of silver in military history. We're going to get into this. This is from the American Scientist, and this is quite a fascinating article. From Treasury Vault to the Manhattan Project. There's a lot in this article about how the U.S. War Department barred 14,000 tons of government silver in its drive to make the world's first atomic bomb. Fascinating indeed. Some people had made me aware of this article in the past and made note of it to do this, knowing that it would be kind of more of an in-depth video, but I think it's interesting and I think it's important to go over the details. And the American Scientist article provides probably the most concise but detailed enough to understand how important the role of silver played in this. I think you'll find it quite exciting and intriguing. And it will also remind you of your, of your high school chemistry classes as well. The U.S. Army's World War II Manhattan Project was a drama unlike any other with larger-than-life starring personalities, a supporting cast of more than 100,000 cutting-edge science, espionage, and diplomatic intrigue. If that wasn't enough, billions of dollars were gambled in on the construction of an enormous secret facility to produce materials for a devastating weapon that might not work. All this played out against the background of worldwide conflict and the profound threat that Nazi Germany might achieve the world's most powerful weapon first. Any compelling drama includes subplots, and the Manhattan Project was no exception. While the main veins of the science, engineering, ethics, and geopolitical implications surrounding the development of nuclear weapons have been well mined by historians, some aspects of the Manhattan Project have attracted less study. Over the past few years, I have researched several, uh, including the so-called Silver Program, the program was fundamental to finding a means to safely and quickly produce the tens of kilograms of uranium necessary for a weapon of mass destruction. And again, I can't reiterate that enough because Nazi Germany uh, was on the path to creating a weapon as well. And because we created it first, and thankfully, thanks to American and Russian troops, we did stop through conventional means. Um, this uh, Hitler, but an alternative universe as such has played out in the in the series called The Man in the High Castle, from which you can watch. And in that series, Washington D.C. is uh, is destroyed by a nuclear bomb. So this is something that we needed to do uh, in the case that uh, Germany was to survive after April 1945. And uh, so this is quite fascinating indeed. Uh, the program uh, was fundamental to finding a means to safely and quickly produce the tens of kilograms of uranium necessary for a weapon of mass destruction, as noted. And here we see a more complete picture of the bullion that was taken from the Treasury for this project. Fascinating indeed. There's a larger photograph of it. Look at all that silver. Amazing. The secret government project to build the bomb was handed from the Office of Scientific Research and Development to the War Department in 1942. Management fell first to Colonel James C. Marshall of the Syracuse District of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Marshall was ordered to establish a new district with no geographical boundaries. Its first offices were at the Atlanta Division Headquarters in Broadway in New York City, hence the origin of the Manhattan Engineer District, later called the Manhattan Project. Colonel <clears throat> Leslie Groves was appointed commanding general of the new district in September 1942, a positive senior to that of Marshall, who remained district engineer until August 1943 when his deputy, 
Colonel Kenneth Nichols replaced him. The paramount problem for the MED was finding means to produce sufficient enriched uranium for an atomic bomb. By early 1942, only milligram style scale quantities of uranium negative 235 had been isolated, and it was by no means clear if any of the laboratory methods in use could uh, be ramped up to industrial scale. Research into several techniques was fast-tracked, and three ultimately were used at Oak Ridge. A fourth approach to securing fissile material, synthesis of plutonium, was used in giant reactors located in Hanford, Washington. From the beginning, electromagnetic mass spectroscopy was, in, and the spectroscopy was identified as a promising method and it quickly became clear to Marshall and Nichols that massive quantities of copper would be needed for the magnet's windings. But copper, used in shell casings, was a high-priority commodity during the war. We know this especially in 1943 because that was when cents were made out of steel. So Marshall and Nichols struck on the idea of using silver as a substitute. And it goes to show you that silver was of sufficient quantity because it was also used in nickels because the copper, because the nickels contained 75% copper, so they substituted some silver in there for those war nickels between 1942 and 1945. Congress had authorized the use of eight, up to 86,000 tons of Treasury Department silver for defense purposes, not having to divert Mass amounts of copper was a huge boon for the project's secrecy. Nichols met with Undersecretary of the Treasury Daniel Bell on August 3, 1942, to inquire about borrowing 6,000 tons of silver from the Treasury vaults. In his memoirs, Nichols relates that Bell indignantly informed him that the Treasury's unit of measure was in the Troy ounces, although not all present at that meeting recalled the unpleasantries. I will revert now to the statement here, uh, and Wikipedia captures this, and uh, we'll see exactly what it said here, and that Nichols recalled the conversation. He explained that the procedure for transferring the silver and asked, how much do you need? I replied, 6,000 tons. He said, how many troy ounces is that? He asked. In fact, I did not how know how to convert tons of troy ounces, and neither did he. A little impatient, I responded, I don't know how many troy ounces we need, but I know I need 6,000 tons. That's a definite quantity. What difference does it make how we express the quantity? He replied rather indignantly, young man, you may think of silver in tons, but the treasury will always think of silver in troy ounces. Interesting indeed. And that's how we measure silver in this community to, as well in Troy ounces. Uh, many MED documents do report the quantities of silver in Troy ounces and fine Troy ounces at 480 grains a Troy ounce is somewhat heavier than a common Avidoporous ounce which weighs in at 437.5 grains. Fine Troy ounces FTOs refer to the purity of the bullion a 1,000 troy ounce silver bar of fineness of 900 contains 900 fine troy ounces of pure silver. For convenience, I quote weighs, weights and pounds of metals here after accounting for fineness. It's not uncommon to read Grove's description as arrogant, arbitrary, insensitive, overbearing, and high-handed. More appropriate labels might be mission-focused and supremely competent. Groves graduated fourth in his 1918 West Point class and also trained in the Army Engineer School, the Command and General Staff School, and the Army War College. His career in the Corps of Engineers was marked by steady advancement. When he assumed command of the MED, uh, he was Deputy Chief of Construction of the Corps of Engineers responsible for all domestic military construction. He just overseeing the building of the Pentagon, and was well versed in the capability of large scale contractors. It was Groves who selected J. Robert Oppenheimer to be the scientific director of the Los Alamos Laboratory where the bomb was designed and built. The biographer Robert Norris described Groves as a project's indispensable man. 
and Nicholas's blunder words, General Groves is the biggest SOB I've ever worked for. He is most demanding, he is most critical, he is abrasive and sarcastic, he's extremely intelligent, abounds with energy. I've had to do my part in the atomic bomb project over again and had the privilege of picking my boss. I would pick General Groves. Cyclotrons and Calotrons is moving the next part here. One of Groves' first actions of the MED was to acquire a large tract of relatively isolated land in eastern Tennessee uh, that had been deemed suitable for establishing enrichment facilities. The Army evicted some 1,000 families to take possession of a roughly rectangular tract of about 90 square miles located 20 miles west of Knoxville to establish the Clinton Engineer Works. The electromagnetic separation plant, code named Y-12, was to be built there. Construction of Y-12 was an enormous undertaking, requiring 67 million hours of labor by a workforce that peaked at about 20,000. The complex included more than 200 support buildings and required some 5,000 operating and maintenance personnel. Most had no idea what they were producing until President Truman announced that an atomic bomb had been dropped on Hiroshima. And here's a picture of work at the Berkeley National Laboratory. The need for so much silver at Y-12 emerged from the physics underlying electromagnetic mass spectroscopy. Spectroscopy, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. In an optical context, spectroscopy uh, refers to using the prism to separate light into constituent wavelengths. Similarly, mass spectroscopy measures atoms or molecules by their masses, with a magnetic field playing the role of the prism. The mass spectroscopes used at Oak Ridge were derived from Ernest Lawrence's Nobel Prize winning cyclotron, which he invented in 1931. Lawrence's original device had nothing to do with enriching uranium. He invented it to respond to a growing crisis in nuclear physics research. Throughout the 1920s, uh, nuclear physicists depended on purely natural phenomena such as alpha decay to supply the projectiles used to bombard target elements and induce reactions. But alpha particles, helium nuclei, arising from the natural decays, are of rather low energy and are readily repelled by the protons residing within a nuclei of even middleweight target elements. For practical purposes, experimenters were restricted to lighter target elements such as aluminum and magnesium. By the late 1920s, they were rapidly running out of potential targets that needed a means to artificially speed up the bombarding project projectiles. And here we see the uh, the uh, Y-12 National Security Complex. What a massive undertaking just in the construction. Lawrence's cyclotron opened a vast new experimental horizon for nuclear reaction researchers. In the device, two D-shaped metal vacuum tanks were placed back to back with both perpendicular to a stronger magnetic field. Ions injected at the center of the tank. Tanks were accelerated towards their size by alternating the tank's electrical polarities at high frequency. Meanwhile, the magnetic field enacting the Lawrence force law would try to nudge ions into spiral paths. The ions consequently moved in spiral trajectories and would eventually strike the outer walls of the tanks where they reached targets up to, set up to induce the reactions under study. Lawrence's first cyclotron was about 5 inches in diameter. By 1939, he had developed one with 60-inch diameter that required a 220-ton magnet. And all this background information is important because it's going to tell us how and why silver is going to be used uh, for this Manhattan Project. And Lawrence's Calutron, a contraction of California University Cyclotron, ionized and accelerated uranium tetrachloride molecules were released into vacuum tanks which stood vertically between coils of massive electromagnetics. Because the force that a magnetic field exerts on a charged particle and, and perpendicular to the velocity of the particle, a field can do no work on the particle. That is, its speed does not change, but its direction does. A textbook application of centripetal force. That is what makes the ion trajectories circular. Interesting indeed. In this context, researchers discovered that the radius of a given ion's orbit depends on the strength of the magnetic field 
the extent of its ionization, the speed at which it enters a magnetic field, and most importantly, its mass. Ions of greater mass will travel in orbits of larger radii than those of lesser mass. In the case of uranium, two separate ion stream result, one for the rare fissile isotope of atomic mass 235, which accounts for only 0.7% of natural uranium, and one for the common non-fossile isotope of mass 238. Since the separation of ion streams, it's, it's widest after only half an orbit. Isotopes were collected there. Subsequently, 235 uranium was chemically separated from the tetrachloride molecules. The design and power requirements for the calotron tanks were simpler than those of the cyclotrons because it was not necessary to generate an electric field inside those tanks. Despite the simplicity of the method on paper, a host of confounding issues arose at Oak Ridge. To sort uranium ions, a magnetic field needed to be very uniform. Molecules ionized differently than those that was ideal for the radius of the vacuum tanks splattered against the tank's inner walls um, and had to be scraped out. The resulting collection efficiency was only about 10%. Random thermal variations of the ion's initial velocities inevitably led to some mixing of streams. You've heard of crossing the streams and ghost bushers. Well, this is letting to something else here, producing enrichment rather than separation. Complicating things even more, the mass difference between the two uranium isotopes is close to just 1%, meaning the stream separation was minuscule unless the magnetic field was extremely strong. And the like charged ion streams repelled each other and hence displaced the trajectories from ideal curves. The effect limited production rates of individual vacuum tanks to a scant 100 milligrams of, of 235U per day. To produce a nearly 50 kilogram critical mass of 235U, uh, Y12 eventually was fitted with more than 1,000 tanks, many containing multiple ion sources. And here we get into the silver used for it. Lawrence and his Berkeley uh, colleagues developed two basic designs for the Y12 enrichers, alpha and beta units. Alpha units enrich uranium to about 15%, uh, 235U. That processed material was uh, fed to the beta units, which enriched it to bomb grade level, 90%, 235U. This meant that the beta units could be smaller, resulting in savings of power and precious materials. Continuous innovation was a hallmark of the Manhattan Project, and designs for both types of enrichers evolved considerably with experience. And here we see an example of the security of inside the security complex there. Notice the circular shape of this unit here and these. Fascinating. So early in 1943, Groves authorized construction of five Alpha-1 enrichers containing 96 tanks with square-shaped coils. The components were arranged in oval configuration called racetracks, but the tanks at the curved portions of the oval racetracks were difficult to regulate. In the fall of 1943, the enrichers were supplemented by four Alpha-2 tracks, which also contained 96 tanks and were laid out by rectangular configuration with single units lined up on each side of the racetrack. Beta units contained 36 tanks laid out in a rectangular configuration to use D-shaped coils. Groves initially authorized two beta units, but eventually approved eight, the last of which came online after the war ended in late 1945. Eventually, nine alpha and eight beta units contained a total of 1,152 vacuum tanks. And here we see an example of a racetrack and a blow up of the square uh, units here with what goes on with uranium enrichment there, with a vacuum pump. Interesting indeed. This is where all the Treasury Department silver comes in. The metal was needed to produce coils to make the Calotron's giant solenoids, which produce a needed high-intensity magnetic field in accordance with the Biosaver Law, which describes the strength and orientation of a magnetic field created by an electric current. And there it is. It's all about electric current. It's the most um, conductive metal out there. Silver is. For the alpha units, the combination of uh, uh, practicable ion speed and magnetic field 
yielded ion streams of about 3 meters in diameter and maximum separation of just over a centimeter. Based on a 3 meter side length for the coils and estimating 30 windings for each, one can calculate that the current and flow through must have met that been about 30,000 amperes. At its peak of operation in the th summer of 1945, the Clinton Engineer Works consumed about 1% of the electrical power produced in the United States. Wow! That's amazing. That's a huge amount of power. Much of it th flowing through those silver coils. Secretary of War Henry Stinson formally requested the silver in a letter to Secretary of the Treasury Henry Mogenthu Jr. Um, on August the 29th, 1942. Stimson gave no indication on what the silver will be used for, saying that only the, only the project is a highly secret matter. His letter stipulated that the silver would be the finest of 0 .999, that title would remain with the United States, and that any silver received by the War Department would be returned in the original quantity, form, and finest to the place from which it was removed. The stated deadline for returning the silver was five years from its receipt or upon written notice from the Treasury that all or any part of it was needed for reasons connected with monetary requirements of the United States. Stimson assured Morgenthau that the metal would be installed only in government-owned plants. The War Department eventually withdrew more than 400 thousand bullion bars of approximately 1,000 fine troy ounces each from the West Point Bullion Depository in West Point, New York, a treasury facility known as the Fort Knox of Silver. That amount is equivalent to the weight of about 7,500 mid-size automobiles today and some 250 fully loaded World War II B-29 bombers. The first bars were withdrawn on October 30, 1942, and were trucked about 70 miles south to the U.S. Metals Refining uh, Company facility in Carteret, New Jersey. The next day, the plant began casting the bars into cylindrical billets weighing about 400 pounds each. By the time casting operations ceased in January 1944, just about 75,000 billets weighing nearly 31 million pounds had been cast. Remarkably, this weight exceeded the 29.4 million pounds withdrawn from the Treasury. This was due to very careful cleanup operations of the fabrication facilities. Machines, tools, furnaces, factory floors, and storage areas that had accumulated the, a year's worth of metal shards were dismantled and scraped clean. Any silver found was separated and cast back into bullion bars. Amazing. Each worker's coveralls were vacuum cleaned. Armed guards were observed every processing step to ensure that all trimmings were recovered. Sounds like gold production facility. So here, silver was treated like gold. Pretty fascinating stuff indeed. Scrap recovery and cleanup operations were so successful that over the course of processing, more than 1.5 million pounds of silver were collected and returned to the treasury much of it likely originating from earlier and unrelated silver processing. That more than offset a small, a much smaller amount, 11,000 pounds of borrowed treasury of silver that was unaccounted for. And just think about that for a moment, because quite possibly some of the constitutional silver that you have could have taken part in the Manhattan Project. That's kind of wild to think about. Once cast, those billets were trucked a few miles north to the Phelps Dodge Copper Products Company plant in Bayway, New Jersey. There, the billets were heated and extruded into strips that were 3 inches wide by 5 and 8 inches thick and 40 to 50 feet long. At the Manhattan Project, Silver Project was shaped today, one of the of one strip of that same width and thickness, it would reach from Washington, D.C. to outside Chicago. After being cooled, the strips were cold rolled into various thicknesses depending on the particular magnet coils for which they were intended. Then they were formed into tight coils, not yet the magnetic coils that were about the size of large automobile tires. More than 74,000 coils were produced, most of which shipped to Wisconsin for magnet fabrication, but some 268,000 pounds 
were sent directly to Oak Ridge to be formed on site the nearly 9,000 bus bar pieces. The bus bars were uh, massive conductors about a foot square uh, that carried current to the magnetic coils. During their manufacture, armed guards again stood by, this time with pieces of paper positioned to catch drill dust as workmen bored holes in a piece of silver for preparation for fastening them, to them together. Look at that. There they are. Fascinating indeed. The coil strips were sh shipped from New Jersey to Wisconsin by rail, usually in shipments of six sealed cars, with each shipment containing about 300 coils. The coils were under 24-hour guard. No fewer than three armed guards rode along a special caboose on each trip. At the Alice Chalmers Manufacturing Company in w Milwaukee, coils were unwound and joined together with silver solder to form larger reels which were fed into a special machine and wound them into steel bobbins of the magnet ca uh, casings. Between February 1943 and August 1944, 940 magnets were wound. On average, each contained about 14 tons of silver. Those coils were then shipped to Oak Ridge on flat cars. These uh, didn't require guards because the silver was uh, inside welded shut steel casings. So there we see how it look West Point, you see the the graphic of how they were transferred from bars to billets to the um, to the uh, coils. Fascinating indeed process. The pace of work at the Y-12 facility was sh uh, swift. Ground for the first Alpha building was broken in February 1943 before the facility's design was even complete. And just as the first load of coils was being shipped to Tennessee, the first Alpha track started up just nine months later. On November 13th, through its initial operation was short-lived. The winding shor uh, short out because the coils were too close together and because of insulating oil was contaminated with organic material. Operations were halted and 80 Alpha 1 magnets had to be, magnets had to be returned to Milwaukee for rebuilding. The second Alpha track entered the service on January 22, 1944, and then rebuilt first track by March 3rd. By late January 45, nine Alpha racetracks containing 864 calutrons and six Beta racetracks containing 216 uh, calutrons were operating in at least eight sizable buildings within uh, Y-12 complex. And so it talks about the success here at the end. Uh, the need for isotope accumulation gradually at Oak Ridge. By uh, April 1945, the Y-12 facility had produced only 25 kilograms of bomb-grade uranium, and in conjunction with other enrichment uh, methods, was producing more than about 200 grams per day. By mid-July, the facility had produced slightly more than 50 kilograms. By this time, Y-12 had consumed about 1.6 billion kilowatt hours of electricity, about 100 times the energy yielded by the bomb called Little Boy, which was dropped in Hiroshima on August 6, 1945. Essentially, every atom of U-235 used in Little Boy was processed in Lawrence's calotrons. By the end of 1946, Y-12's cumulative production amounted to just more than 1,000 kilograms of, of uh, 235 uranium, the equivalent of about 15 Little Boys. Wow, there's the photo there. Interesting. So, uh, the by late 1946, the gaseous diffusion a method of uranium separation was operating much more efficiently than the electromagnetic process. So, uranium enrichment in all but one Y-12 building was shut down that December. The last of the Manhattan, Manhattan Project Silver, however, wasn't returned to West Point until June 1st, 1970. That's the last of it. Uh, just a few weeks before Groves died, some of the Y-12 cold colotrons continued to be used in separate every uh, element in the periodic table. Wow. There's another photograph. Notice the curved structure there. <clears throat> After the war, many colotrons were refitted with copper windings, but not the colotrons in what was called the pilot plant. The operations until 1974 with 667 tons of silver in their magnetic windings until 1970. Some of that wire, by the way, uh, was very, very fine. And uh, I happened to uh, come across some of it through my local coin shop 
um, that was sold based off of a, they said it was from a nuclear uh, reactor for nuclear subs. Um, and some of that silver hair you've seen in my videos, uh, if you search my videos for silver hair, we actually melted some of it down. Some of that was actually 925 silver. Others of it was 999. It's very difficult to tell. The color terms developed for the Manhattan Project separated stable isotopes until 1998 when cheaper isotope sources forced the operation to close. And uh, sadly, part of the reason why this country faces a shortage of medical isotopes today is because those facilities were shut down. And the article kind of finishes out here um, and recaps some of it. But, by the, but fascinating to see how much silver was used and how crucial it was in the war effort um, and, and uh, to help really save uh, what could have been a much wider conflict, much more involved. Uh, we beat the Germans and, um, and, and you know, and, and, and even really the Russians to creating a nuclear bomb, uh, which, which kind of shaped the nuclear age in America. Quite fascinating indeed to see how things developed with the war and uh, what happened and how silver played an integral role in the Manhattan Project. So I hope you enjoyed this in-depth look here and thanks to the American scientists for uh, uh, laying this out, a fascinating history and how silver played a crucial part in it. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I'd like to extend a multitude of gratitude to you all for watching and encourage you to please rate, comment, and subscribe.